Okay, um, so it's uh, really an incredible honor for me to be introducing our next speaker, uh, Melissa Rosenkrantz. Uh, and uh, it is a great way to end what has been an amazing symposium. Um, uh, it's uh, really quite extraordinary since I've known Melissa since she was an undergraduate. Uh, she has uh, been at Wisconsin. She has worked her way up through the ranks, as we say, and uh, received her bachelor's and her PhD from Wisconsin. And it's very unusual for um, any institution like this to hire their own, um, particularly uh, in the um, letters and sciences. Uh, uh, and Melissa is one shining exception. Um, Melissa, early on, showed an interest in relations between uh, the mind and the body and how that might be translated in rigorous science, uh, looking at relations between the brain and various peripheral biological systems that uh, are both affected by the brain and uh, affect the brain. And uh, I was trying to think of the first study that you were involved with, and I think it might have been uh, a, um, uh, a study that we did, which actually turned out to be very highly cited. And among the um, publications that I'm probably least proud of, um, but uh, uh, it, it was a study of um, uh, mindfulness-based stress reduction and looking at the effects on both changes in the brain measured with EEG uh, and also looking at the response to an influenza vaccine uh, and showing some differences between a group that had been randomly assigned to the meditation condition and a control group. Uh, and from that, Melissa really... Um, developed her uh, interest in this area, and um, uh, they blossomed very, very quickly. Uh, for her uh, specialty prelim as a psychology graduate student, she wrote this extraordinary piece on the role of substance P, uh, and uh, that ended up being a sole-authored publication that came out in Psych Bulletin. There aren't that many graduate students that have sole authored publications. Um, and um, uh, I was Melissa's supervisor, but I um, contributed absolutely zero to that paper and felt that I really had no, um, shouldn't be an author. Uh, and it, I love that, um, uh, that Melissa was the sole author of that very appropriately. Uh, she's continued that work um, uh, looking at relations between the brain and the periphery in the context of a well-characterized illness, asthma, that we'll hear a lot about today, and has marshaled um, an extraordinary group of collaborators. Uh, and um, uh, it really is a testament not only to her um, uh, cognitive intelligence, but her emotional intelligence to be able to manage uh, this complex array of collaborations that are required to do this kind of really complex work. Uh, and she's been able to pull it off and do it in um, really a masterful way, and it keeps expanding and uh, uh, getting deeper and more rigorous uh, and more impactful. And um, uh, it's really been a privilege to have her part of our center and contributing in the ways in which she does. Uh, Melissa was the principal instructor of a course for college fres freshmen this past year on the art and science of human flourishing. And it's really been great to have someone with that kind of scientific acumen uh, teaching uh, a course of that sort. Um, uh, and uh, 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 Melissa is a fierce scientist. The, her um, ferocity um, uh, is expressed in many other domains. Uh, 
as well. Some of you may not know that she has um, completed two Ironmen, um, full Ironmen, uh, uh, and uh, uh, it just, um, I think, expresses the kind of tenacity that she has uh, as a, a human being and um, when she channels it into her science, amazing results unfold. So um, I'll stop talking uh, and um, ask Melissa to please join us. Thank you, Melissa. Thank you, Richie, and um, thank you. Is that better? Okay. And um, thank both you and Ned for inviting me to be part of this symposium. It really is a true honor um, for me, um, because for those of you who don't know, I was one of the students in this T32 program that are sitting up here as both a pre-doc and a post-doc, and never in a million years did I think that <laughs> I would eventually end up on the other side um, of this podium. So it could happen to you too. Um, and um, Ned asked me to say just a few words about my career trajectory, um, which has been long and winding and unconventional. Um, I'm happy to talk with any of you about that afterward. I'm not going to say a lot about it right now, except um, something that Richie highlighted. And actually, every speaker so far on this panel has said either explicitly or implicitly um, acknowledged the importance of collaboration. And I would say that I credit whatever measure of success that I've had, but certainly my continued love of what I do to the collaborations that I've had. Um, as you'll see in my talk, um, my work has covered many, many different methods. Um, and I wouldn't have been able to do this work at all if it weren't for team science. And um, especially for those who are just starting your career, don't be afraid of collaboration. and team science, it really is um, going to be required, both to acquire the sample sizes that you need, as well as the diversity of methods. Um, so I'll, without further ado, I'll get started because my talk is just a tad long. So um, please bear with me on that. But um, the work that I'm going to share with you is focused on the relationship between emotion and inflammation, the mechanisms that give rise to this relationship, and how they can be harnessed to promote well-being. Um, among the many different immune processes that one could study in trying to gain a better understanding of the relationship between mind and body and as it relates to the promotion of um, health and well-being, most of the work that I'm going to talk about has focused on inflammation, um, which is an absolutely essential part of immune system function and in many ways is very protective. Um, but inflammation is, or the function of the immune system is like an intricate dance that requires balance. And so when inflammation occurs chronically or when it occurs in an inappropriate context, it can actually cause disease. Inflammation is also um, the most um, well-studied immune process in relationship to emotion. Um, for example, psychological stress is one of the most um, robust and reproducible provocateurs of um, inflammation. And this relationship goes the other way as well, where um, inflammation in the body provokes symptoms that remarkably resemble depression. And um, unfortunately, psychological stress is a more or less ubiquitous part of daily life in the modern world. And this may be a contributing factor to the increasing um, prevalence of both chronic inflammatory diseases, as well as mood and anxiety disorders. Um, if you look at the um, leading contributors to years lost to disability in the United States, you'll see that um, chronic inflammation is an important underlying component of the pathophysiology in at least the top six. And it's not surprising that these same conditions are notoriously vulnerable to stress and emotion related exacerbation. And um, uh, as Richie indicated in the introduction, uh, most of the work that I'm going to talk about today has used asthma as a model to understand the mechanisms through which stress and emotion impact inflammation and vice versa. Um, 
So asthma makes a really beautiful model for this work for a variety of reasons, um, one of which it's highly prevalent. Asthma affects about one in 10 people in the United States. And it's also a disease that spans the life course. It's typically diagnosed in the first decade of life and it needs to be managed throughout the entire life course. There's no cure for asthma. Um, and there are different points in life where um, exacerbations are more common. And importantly, for an experimental scientist, asthma lends itself very well to study in the laboratory and um, to experimental designs. We can provoke an episode of asthma or um, airway inflammation in the laboratory safely and without it being particularly unpleasant or um, invasive to our research participants. So I can't really talk about um, asthma without acknowledging my um, collaborators in allergy and pulmonary medicine, who none of this work would have happened without. Um, in the top right here, we have Bill Bussey, who is a long-term collaborator of mine. He's um, an allergy and asthma physician. Um, he retired this past year, and um, I am now working with Nazar Jarjour. Um, Stefan is no, um, on the bottom left is a molecular biologist who generated most of the um, cellular and molecular level data that I'll talk about. And Danica Klaus is really a truly extraordinary pulmonary nurse coordinator who interacted with all of the participants um, and was involved in the clinical measures acquired here. And um, as I go through my talk today, you'll see various people's pictures on associated with data. I hope that I remember to acknowledge them, but if I don't, um, it's really just um, uh, acknowledgement of the role that they have played. So before I get into um, the weeds with my talk, I wanna give an overview to help you understand how all the different pieces fit together. Um, first, I'm gonna be talking about how the brain and the immune system interact in asthma. Um, with a focus on the, the neural and the um, immune pathways that give rise to this relationship. This is the longest part of my talk. Um, then I'll talk about how um, stress impacts airway inflammation and asthma, um, whether these relationships are purely functional or whether they may um, be at least partially secondary to underlying neuroinflammatory processes, what the long-term consequences of these relationships might be, whether behavioral interventions can be helpful. And then I'll spend just a minute talking about what the um, potential therapeutic implications of these relationships are. So first, how do the brain and the immune system interact in asthma? In the first study that I'll share with you, we perturbed the lung and then we measured the impact of this perturbation on the brain. And then we measured the impact of the descending um, response of, that, of those neural changes on subsequent changes in the lung. So really this full bi-directional um, relationship of communication. We perturbed the lung using what's called a whole lung allergen challenge where participants actually inhale nebulized extracts of the allergens that provoke their asthma. And in order for you to, um, to help you understand this paradigm, I'm gonna really quickly walk you through what happens in the lung during a typical asthmatic reaction. So when an allergen, in this case cat dander, is inhaled, it causes mast cells in the lungs to, re to release histamine, leukotrienes, and prostaglandins. And those um, immune mediators act on the bronchial smooth muscle to cause bronchoconstriction or a narrowing of the airways. And this is characteristic of what's called the early phase of the asthma episode um, and is what most people associate with the experience of an asthma attack, the sort of chest tightness um, and constriction that they feel in their lungs. In most people with asthma, the early phase resolves and lung function returns to normal within about an hour. But in some people, these um, immune mediators of the early phase recruit other immune cells, um, mostly eosinophils, but also neutrophils as well to move from the blood into the lungs. And in the lungs, they cause um, inflammation, the blockage of bronchial passages and tissue damage. And I'll refer to people who have both that early and the late phase components. This is the late phase, by the way, <laughs> um, who have both the early and the late phase components of their response to allergen as late phase responders. And I can use this schematic to illustrate what we would expect to see in the airways in response to allergen challenge in somebody who has both that early and late phase response. 
um, we would expect to see an initial decline in lung function that's attributed to bronchoconstriction, a return to normal, and then a second decline in lung function without any additional exposure to allergen between four and eight hours after the allergen challenge. This is due to inflammation. As a control manipulation, we used inhaled methacholine, which um, makes a really um, beautiful control condition because it's a smooth muscle constrictor. And um, so it mimics the effects of the early phase response to allergen. And it allowed me to, um, to separate the neural signals that uh, are driven by bronchoconstriction from the neural signals related to inflammation. And in this study, all participants received both allergen and methacholine challenge. The administration was, um, the order of administration was randomized and it was blinded. So participants didn't know if they'd gotten methacholine or allergen. So I can use this schematic again to illustrate what we would expect to see in terms of lung function in response to methacholine challenge where you have uh, that immediate decline in lung function, similar to the early phase um, that returns to normal and no, no subsequent decline in lung function. Um, we collect fMRI data in this study at uh, about four hours after the allergen challenge. And this was time to just precede the onset of that late phase response, but lung function had not yet changed um, during the acquisition of the fMRI data. And because the, challenge, the challenges were randomized and double-blinded, participants did not know if they would go on to have a late phase response or not. And so acquiring fMRI data here could um, tell me what um, neural circuits might be responsive to the events of the early phase and or contributing to the development of that late phase response. In addition to the, um, the allergen versus methacholine challenge, we also had a group comparison in the study where we examined, where we compared really the neural response to um, methacholine and allergen challenge in those who have a late phase response, those who only have that early phase response and to a group of healthy non-asthmatic controls. And this just provided me with another way to zero in on inflammation as the signal of interest. I can use this schematic again to show what we would expect to see in um, response to allergen challenge in each of these three groups. So the late phase responders should show both that early and the late phase um, decline in lung function. Those who only have the early phase response should show only that um, initial bronchoconstrictive um, decline in lung function and the healthy controls shouldn't show any effect at all because they're not sensitive to allergen. Our primary measure of airway inflammation in this study was the number of eosinophils that infiltrated lung tissue. So eosinophils are an inflammatory immune cell important in the allergic response. And we measured changes in um, eosinophils in the lung by collecting sputum samples at baseline and then 24 hours after the allergen challenge. And what this plot shows is that the um, airway inflammatory response was specific to um, those who have a late phase response in response to the allergen challenge. Um, during the acquisition of fMRI data, our participants viewed a series of words and they were asked to identify the color of the letters spelling those words. Some of the words were asthma specific, some were generally negative, and some were valence neutral. And this task really just served as a probe for the neural circuits that um, were involved in the emotional response to disease-related, physiologically salient cognitive cues. And my hypotheses about the neural circuits involved in this response were focused on the insula in this study. Um, and they were focused on the insula because it's a major hub of what's called the salience network. We've heard some about the salience network in the previous talks today, um, but for those of you who aren't familiar with it, it's really just a collection of brain regions that help to determine how information coming into the brain gets prioritized, what, what we should pay attention to. And as part of the salience network, the insula is very important in integrating interoceptive information or information that's coming up from the body, informing the brain about what's happening in the body and disturbances in homeostasis and integrating that information with a cognitive and emotional context. So this is really where the body and the mind come together such that the function of the body 
can influence emotion and our perception of the world. For example, the insula is involved in um, generating a subjective experience that we have in relationship to those homeostatic disturbances in the body. And it's also important in um, coordinating the neural response to whatever that homeostatic disturbance requires. So the data from this study do indeed support increased engagement of the insula in response to allergen challenge. The, um, let me see if this works here. No, it doesn't. Okay. Um, the, the cluster that you see highlighted in the crosshairs is in the anterior insula, and it reflects a group by challenge by valence interaction, which was driven by the response to asthma words compared to negative words during the allergen compared to methicoline challenge, specifically in those who have that late phase response. So really when inflammation is happening in the airway. In addition, the degree to which um, activity increased in this area of the insula was related to the magnitude of the airway inflammatory response that was measured 24 hours later. And so while this correlation certainly doesn't imply that the insula caused a larger airway inflammatory response. The temporal precedence of when uh, the fMRI data were collected relative to when um, we measured the change in speed of eosinophils does hint at the possibility that the insula is involved in descending um, regulation of um, the immune system in generating that airway inflammatory response. So in a follow-up study, we used a very similar design. And um, the goal of this study was, was more to identify the signaling pathways between the lung and the brain that give rise to these changes in neural reactivity. And in this study, instead of using a whole lung allergen challenge, we used what's called a segmental bronchial provocation, where allergen is inserted into a single segment of the airway using bronchoscopy. And this generates a very intense inflammatory response, but it's confined to just that single airway segment. And so there's no change in lung function whatsoever. And it obviated the need for the methicoline challenge. And um, let's see, what else do I wanna say about that? Um, during the acquisition of fMRI data, again, participants performed um, this task where they were identifying the color of the letters, spelling asthma, generally negative and valence neutral words. And our hypotheses were, um, again, focused on the salience network only this time we expanded that to include the anterior cingulate cortex and the amygdala in addition to the insula. Um, in this study, fMRI data were collected at baseline in 48 hours after the segmental challenge. So we were able to use the bronchoscopy in this study to um, harvest lavage fluid in the challenged airway segment. Um, and this allowed us a much deeper and more comprehensive assessment of the signaling pathways that were changing in response to the segmental challenge. So in that lavage fluid, we measured changes in cell populations, in cytokines, and in gene expression networks. And um, the first thing that we did in the study was demonstrate that the segmental challenge did indeed produce a robust airway inflammatory response which it did as we see in the change in the number of eosinophils in lavage fluid. And that change in eosinophils was um, robustly associated with the increase in the insula response to asthma specific words. This was a conceptual replication of the prior study, which was nice to see in an independent sample, but this wasn't new. In addition, we um, saw a robust increase in IL-17A, which is another pro-inflammatory cytokine, the significance of which I'll get to in just a minute. Um, and that increase in IL-17A was also significantly associated with the insula response to asthma-specific words. In terms of the changes in gene expression, um, we had help in these analyses from our colleagues at the University of Washington, Kim Dill McFarland, who's a biostatistician, and Matt Altman, who is um, a pulmonary physician. And um, they did an unbiased RNA sequencing of cells that were acquired from the lavage fluid and did um, cell deconvolution and a weighted gene co-expression network analysis in order to identify groups of co-regulated genes or genes that were changing together in response to the segmental challenge. And the results of this analysis 
were largely dominated by two networks of genes. One network reflected um, sort of what you would expect, the canonical type two eosinophilic airway um, response. And the second, which is shown here, um, reflected more of an IL-17 pathway response and a related set of pro-inflammatory genes. You don't have to pay attention to the details here. I'm gonna come back to this in just a minute. So just tuck that in your back pocket um, because we also wanted to know um, how the results of the RNA sequencing were related to changes in activity in nodes of the salience network. And um, for this, Kim performed a sparse partially squared regression analysis, which is conceptually similar to like a principal components analysis applied in a regression um, framework. And it identified 13 proteins in one gene module that were consistently and robustly associated with changes in activity in the salience network, as shown in this correlation heat map. And interestingly, it was not the type two response, this eosinophilic response that was most robustly related to changes in the salience network. It was IL-17A and this um, network of co-regulated genes. So coming back to that, um, the genes that were functionally central to this network were NOTCH1, VEGFA, and IL-17A. So in the airways, NOTCH is very important in recruiting cells to the airway and increasing the proliferation of Th17 cells. In the brain, NOTCH regulates the development and um, proliferation of glial cells and drives differentiation of astrocytes. So both of these types of cells are important in the neuroinflammatory response, which may be um, one of the proximal causes of the changes in the functional activity that we, that we saw in this study as well as in prior studies. VEGFA in the airways is important in promoting blood vessel growth through the proliferation of endothelial cells, as well as increasing vascular leakage and vascular permeability. In the brain, VEGFA is released by reactive astrocytes and increases permeability of the blood-brain barrier. So I wanna try now to put all of this together into the beginnings of a theoretical framework that I'll revisit throughout this talk today. Um, so in response to allergen challenge, the airways um, respond by triggering a, both a, a type two and a type 17 inflammatory response. Um, that gives rise to asthma pathophysiology. Notch one increases the proliferation of Th17 cells. Th17 cells are the principal um, cell that releases IL-17. And IL-17 increases recruitment of eosinophils and neutrophils to the airway. So both of these, um, both of these types of immune responses, the type two and the type 17, have been shown to impact both brain function and behavior. For example, um, IL-17 administration in animal models promotes depressive-like behavior and anti-IL-17 confers resistance to the development of depressive-like behavior, for example, in like chronic stress models. Um, in humans, IL-17 is increased in people with depression, especially in the context of inflammation. Now, there are multiple ways in which these changes that we're measuring in the airway could give rise to these functional changes in the brain that we're seeing. And I'm gonna talk about just one in detail. And I'm gonna get a little bit in the weeds here. So for those of you who don't like weeds, um, really the take home points are that IL-17 is important and it may have something to do with neural inflammation. Um, for those of you who do like the weeds, here we go. Um, during um, episodes of stress or periods of inflammation, um, Th17 cells migrate to and accumulate in the brain. In the brain, these cells release IL-17 that activate microglia and drive the differentiation of astrocytes. Um, they provoke NOTCH1 actually, which is the driver of the differentiation of astrocytes and um, activation of microglia. And in the context of neurodegeneration and neural injury, NOTCH signaling is increased. Um, and it promotes neuroinflammation through these um, mechanisms of, of driving the differentiation of astrocytes and activating microglia. Microglia and astrocytes are intimately involved in neurotransmission through the release of ATP and by regulating the amount of glutamate in the synapse. 
And at the same time, reactive astrocytes release VEGF A, which increases the permeability of the blood brain barrier, amplifying this whole um, neuroinflammatory cascade. So we can see how over time, over repeated episodes of this happening, um, you might have persistent neural changes that give rise to the increase in mood and anxiety disorders that we see in individuals with asthma. Now, this is a theoretical framework, which means that it is a theory. <laughs> um, there are um, many aspects of this that still need to be um, supported empirically, but there is some empirical support for this, most of it coming um, from a, a lab at the University of Cincinnati, a lab of a woman named Renu Shah. And she has shown in a mouse model of this mixed type 2, type 17 um, asthma that exposure to allergen causes a proliferation of Th17 cells. Um, these cells traffic to the brain and, and they accumulate in an area where the blood brain barrier is leaky, an area called the subfornical organ. And neurons from the subfornical organ project to the salience network. Now, when these Th17 cells accumulate in the subfornical organ, they provoke microglial activation. And this microglial activation is associated with um, changes in activity in salience network nodes. So here we can start to see how these, these changes that would seem to be disparate happening in the lung and then changes in neural activity in the brain begin to become related. Oops, forgot that animation. So that was a lot of information. Um, so I'm gonna take a minute just to um, summarize. First, we learned that as part of the salience network, the insula is important in the relationship between emotion and inflammation. Greater insula reactivity to salient cognitive cues in the context of allergen challenge is associated with greater airway inflammation. In addition to the canonical type two eosinophilic response to allergen, the IL-17 pathway may be important in this mind-brain-lung bidirectional network of communication. And changes in neural responsivity, as well as the increased prevalence of depression may be driven at least in part by neuroinflammation. So the study designs that I just described are predicated on the assumption that um, changes uh, due to airway inflammation in the lung are communicated to the brain. And then those changes in the brain are involved in descending regulation of the airway inflammatory response in the lung. But these study designs really don't allow me to parse those ascending and descending aspects of um, communication. And so in the next study, I specifically targeted this descending brain to lung arm of this network um, to ask the question, how does stress, which is a purely psychological manipulation, impact airway inflammation? So um, to provoke a stress response in this study, I used the Trier social stress test. I have a video here, but the sound isn't working. So um, for those of you who don't know what the Trier social stress test is, um, it's, an, it's a, a task where participants have to give an impromptu speech and then do mental arithmetic in front of a panel of extremely unsympathetic um, judges. And it, it's rely, it reliably evokes a physio physiological stress response. It's incredibly unpleasant. My participants would rather have a bronchoscopy than do this. Um, no joke. And in addition to the TSST, um, we also measured the neural response to stress using positron emission tomography or PET. And PET um, really is the perfect tool to use in this context because it allows for the face-to-face -face interaction that makes the TSST so effective. And how this works is that the radio tracer, which in this study was FDG or a form of radio labeled glucose, is injected into the participant just before the TSST. And then it's taken up into the brain while the participant is behaving, while they're performing the TSST. And then when they're positioned into the scanner, the activity that's detected um, reflects the areas of the brain that were metabolizing more glucose or were more active during the TSST. And the stress task was um, contrasted with a control task um, that required all of the same cognitive and motor um, skills that the TSST required, but with the stressful elements removed. Another dimension of this study was the presence of chronic stress. And we assessed chronic stress using the UCLA Chronic Life Stress Interview, 
um, which is a semi-structured interview that um, assesses the function in these nine different domains over the previous six months. And then we use this information to select extreme groups, half with very high and half with low levels of life stress. And this, um, these plots just really drive home the points uh, of the importance of having this high stress group reflected in this sample. Um, those with high levels of chronic stress reported significantly greater symptoms of depression, anxiety, and a greater loss of asthma control. In addition, those with the greatest psychological symptoms were also the same people who had the poorest asthma control. And this was true for both symptoms of anxiety as well as symptoms of depression. In terms of the physiological response to stress, we measured this using cortisol measured in saliva. Um, those who had high levels of chronic stress showed a very robust response to the TSST, um, which is the, shown by the solid line. The broken line is the cortisol response to the control task. Whereas those with low levels of chronic stress still showed quite a robust um, response to the TSST, but it was significantly smaller than those in the high chronic stress group. In terms of the brain response to the TSST, all the images that, are gonna, that I'm gonna show you um, reflect areas of the brain that were metabolizing more glucose during the TSST compared to the control task. There was no effect of chronic stress group in the PET data. Um, the cluster highlighted by the crosshairs here is once again in the ventral anterior insula, which was the focus of our hypotheses in this study. And um, in addition to the insula, we also saw a main effect of stress in the amygdala, um, which has strong functional connectivity with the ventral anterior insula and is known to be responsive to threat. Its activity tends to go vary with the magnitude of emotional arousal. We've heard a lot about this in our, our previous talks. So it's not surprising that the TSST would engage the insula. But interestingly, the magnitude of the insula or the amygdala response to the TSST was related to the overall levels of airway inflammation. So those who had greater airway inflammation had a larger amygdala response to the TSST. And amazingly, the amygdala response to the TSST was also related to the increase in interleukin-1 receptor-1 mRNA measured in lung sputum. Um, interleukin-1 is a pro-inflammatory cytokine that's important in the, in the allergic response, as well as in the immune response to stress. So one of the ways that the amygdala responds to stress is by increasing activation of the sympathetic nervous system, which causes a release of epinephrine and norepinephrine from the adrenals, as well as from um, peripheral terminals throughout the body. And because the well-known immune modulatory capacity of the sympathetic nervous system, this was really one of our prime suspects in connecting changes in the amygdala response with changes in inflammation in the airway. And we measured changes in um, sympathetic nervous system in this study using alpha amylase, concentrations in saliva. And we found that the increase in alpha amylase to the TSST was associated with both the increase in IL-1 receptor 1 mRNA, as well as it with the amygdala response to stress in voxels that showed a relationship with the increase in interleukin-1 receptor 1 mRNA. So we can't make any causal attributions with this data because it's correlational, but we can use them to generate hypotheses that can be tested in future studies. And one such causal hypothesis is the following. During um, stress, uh, the amygdala responds with increased sympathetic nervous system activation. And these sympathetic nerve fibers innervate tissues throughout the body, including the bone marrow. And when um, the sympathetic nervous system stimulates bone marrow, it causes an increase in myelopoiesis with a shift in um, the cells that it produces and releases toward uh, the production and release of um, immature pro-inflammatory monocytes and granulocytes. Um, this was work done by uh, a longtime collaborator, um, John Sheridan at The Ohio State University, one of my very favorite people. Um, him and a whole lineage of his students has beautifully mapped this and shown that um, during stress, when bone marrow is, is stimulated with the sympathetic nervous system, these immature cells it produces migrate to the lung where they're associated with 
an increase in IL-1 beta, which is the principal ligand for the IL-1 receptor 1. In addition to the lung, they also traffic to the brain during stress. And in the brain, they're essential in establishing stress-related anxiety-like behavior in animal models. Um, and this is actually blocked with propranolol, this increase. And so we can begin to see how this relationship between stress, the, the production of inflammation and the migration of these cells back to the brain may perpetuate the relationship between stress, inflammation, and give rise to the increases in psychopathology that we see in these patients. In addition to the sympathetic nervous system, we also examine the relationship between glucocorticoid responses to stress and changes in airway inflammation. And the canonical relationship here is suppressive, where um, the greater the concentration of glucocorticoids, the lower the level of inflammation. And this is what we see in those with low levels of chronic stress. Um, the greater the, the cortisol response to the TSST, the fewer the eosinophils that were measured both in blood as well as in sputum. But this relationship um, was absent in those with high levels of chronic stress. If anything, it maybe went a little bit in the opposite direction. And this is really important because the first line of treatment for people who have asthma is steroids. And if they're not suppressing inflammation and potentially even making it worse, that's a really big problem that we need to think about clinically. So to go back to my original question, how does stress impact airway inflammation and asthma? We learned that um, during stress, glucose metabolism is increased in the amygdala and in the insula and is associated with an increase in um, the inflammatory potential in the airway. We learned that those with high levels of chronic stress reported greater um, symptoms of a depression and anxiety, which were associated with poor asthma control. And although those who have high levels of chronic stress did um, respond with elevations in cortisol in response to the TSST, this did not suppress their inflammatory response um, in the lung and alpha amylase in addition, the mar marker of sympathetic nervous system activity was also associated with a pro-inflammatory environment in the airway. So now I'm gonna move on, actually I'm gonna take a breath and a drink of water um, before I move on and let you all catch your breath. I'm gonna move on to a question that I've been hinting at um, through this entire talk so far. And that is, might these functional changes that we've seen um, be at least partially secondary to neuroinflammatory or neurodegenerative processes? And this was a question that um, was inspired in me um, several years ago by a growing list of studies, of animal studies, showing that inflammation in the body provokes inflammation in the brain. And in some cases, this um, inflammation in the brain leads to neurodegeneration and behavior consistent with cognitive decline. And at the same time, there are epidemiological studies emerging showing that the prevalence of Alzheimer's disease and other forms of dementia was higher in those who have a chronic inflammatory disease, including asthma. And so first to address this question, I used data from the study that I introduced earlier, where um, we provoked an airway inflammatory response using the segmental allergen challenge. In addition to measuring functional MRI data, we also measured or acquired a form of um, structural MRI data called diffusion weighted imaging. And um, we did this in order to measure acute changes in brain microstructure that were caused by the increase in airway inflammation. And just to refresh your memory, the MRI data were collected at baseline and 48 hours after the allergen challenge. Now, I'm not gonna go into any detail in um, explaining diffusion weighted imaging, except to say that it measures the magnitude and orientation of the diffusion of water in the brain, which is constrained by the presence of axons, dendrites, glia, and other cell bodies. Now, I find this um, illustration to be enormously helpful in helping me to understand what diffusion-weighted imaging can tell us about the presence of neural inflammation. And um, it shows um, how the changes in brain microstructure that occur during neuroinflammation would impact the parameters estimated by diffusion-weighted imaging. And so the panel on the right here is um, 
a cartoon um, brain voxel under baseline conditions. The green cells are microglia, the blue cells are um, astrocytes, and the little red dot is a cartoon water molecule. And as you can see, the ability of that water molecule to diffuse freely in this voxel under baseline conditions is constrained to some extent. Now, when you have an acute neuroinflammatory response, which is the center panel, when you have more microglia that are coming in and those microglia become ramified, they extend their processes and actually get bigger, it, the um, ability of this water molecule to, diffu to diffuse freely is reduced, which is reflected in um, the diffusion weighted imaging parameter of F iso or the fraction of isotropic free water is reduced. Under chronic inflammatory conditions, when you actually have cell loss and those microglia are dysmorphic and retract their processes, that water molecule can actually diffuse better than it can, more freely than it can under baseline conditions. And that's reflected in an increase in this diffusion weighted imaging parameter of F iso. So we examined these changes in brain microstructure in response to the segmental allergen challenge in gray and white matter. And um, this work was done in collaboration with Doug Dean and Barb Benlin, who are both faculty here in the UW Department of Medicine. And we found, um, this was a whole brain analysis. So this um, is not a selective um, picture that I'm showing you here. We found relative to pre-challenge a reduction in FISO in gray matter of the insula, which um, suggests an increase in microglial activation. Now, the localization of this effect to the insula is particularly interesting to me because we've seen changes in neural responsivity in this region in every study where we have provoked an airway inflammatory response or a stress response, suggesting that um, that may have an underlying neuroinflammatory component. In addition, um, abnormalities in both structure and function in this region have been implicated in the pathophysiology of depression, especially in the context of inflammation. In white matter, um, relative to pre-challenge, we saw a reduction in F iso in white matter, mostly associated with fibers of the superior longitudinal fasciculus, reduced integrity of which has been previously observed in patients with depression and is believed to contribute to the development of rumination through dysfunction in the default mode network. Now, in full disclosure, we did not find an association between a reduction in F iso in this region with a change in depressive symptoms in our patients. In addition to looking at the main effect of challenge, we also looked at the relationship between these changes in brain microstructure and the magnitude of the inflammatory response. And again, we saw that um, a reduction in F iso in the superior longitudinal fasciculus was associated with a larger inflammatory response in the airways. And finally, we looked at the relationship between change in depressive symptoms as measured by the Beck depression inventory and these changes in brain microstructure. And here we found that a reduction in F iso in um, the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex, which can be hypofunctional in depression, we heard that in Deanna's talk yesterday, um, was associated with an increase in depressive symptoms in these patients. So we've just seen acute effects of airway inflammation on putative measures of neuroinflammation. What might be the consequences of a lifetime of repeated bouts of airway inflammation? And to address this question, um, I pooled data across multiple studies and compared uh, white matter microstructure in 111 individuals with asthma that ranged in severity from mild to very severe um, to 135 um, healthy non-asthma age-matched controls. And here we found um, very large magnitude and widespread uh, differences in white matter microstructure. And this was really across every diffusion weighted imaging parameter we examined, suggesting that this is probably not just a neuroinflammatory response, but there may actually be some neurodegeneration happening here. When we looked at the relationship between um, these changes in white matter microstructure in asthma relative to controls and the degree of asthma severity, we found that the magnitude of deterioration in myelinated axons was more pronounced in those with severe disease. 
And this was true in multiple regions of the brain, including in fiber tracts that have been previously implicated in Alzheimer's disease and in dementia. Now, in order to gain um, more insight into um, the nature of these changes that we identified in white matter microstructure, we examined their relationship with biomarkers that were measured in plasma. And um, these biomarkers are indicative of neurodegeneration and neuroinflammation. Um, first, we used uh, glial fibrillary acidic protein, which is a marker of astrocytic reactivity. That was our marker of neuroinflammation. And neurofilament light chain protein was um, indicative of neuroinflammation. It's a biomarker for axonal injury. And um, the presence of reactive astrocytes is a really important indicator of neuroinflammation. And together with NFL, GFAP is actually used clinically as an indicator of disease severity and progression in several different neurodegenerative diseases. And when we looked at the relationship with these biomarkers and our diffusion weighted imaging metrics, again, we found very large magnitude. These are corrected maps. This is not like a, an uncorrected map that we're showing you here very large magnitude and um, widespread associations with GFAP suggesting that there's definitely a neuroinflammatory process happening here. Um, and with NFL, um, the relationship was more constrained to white, fat, white matter of the corona radiata and internal capsule. Um, the internal capsule is a white matter tract that connects the cortex and midbrain to the brainstem. And deterioration of this white matter tract has been implicated in um, many different disorders of cognition and emotion. And um, several previous studies have shown that the degree of deterioration in this white matter tract is associated with the level of functional impairment. In addition to looking at relationships with white matter microstructure, we also examine the relationship between these biomarkers and disease severity and showed that those with um, more severe asthma have higher concentrations of GFAP in their plasma. And while these plasma biomarkers were tremendously useful in corroborating our interpretation of the diffusion weighted imaging data as reflecting neuroinflammatory and neurodegenerative processes, measurements in cerebral spinal fluid are still the gold standard. And so we analyzed CSF data from a separate sample that was acquired and shared with us by our colleagues at um, the Wisconsin Alzheimer's Disease Research Center here in Madison. And um, the sample was enriched for risk for developing Alzheimer's disease based on family history. And it comprised 60 individuals with asthma, roughly evenly divided among mild, moderate, and severe asthma groups, um, and 315 uh, non-asthma age match controls. And this was work that was done by a postdoc in my lab, in my lab Ajay Nair. And um, when we compared across group uh, levels of these biomarkers in CSF, we found significant elevations in a biomarker for synaptic degeneration called neurogranin in those with severe asthma compared to the other three groups. In addition to the group um, differences, we examined the interactions between these CSF biomarkers and other risk factors um, for Alzheimer's disease, like um, family history and cardiovascular disease. And um, we found that the relationship between cardiovascular disease risk and synaptic degeneration, which was measured using both neurogranin and alveosinuclein here, um, was significantly stronger for those with severe asthma. And we also found that cardiovascular risk in AD specific pathology was associated with a much more rapid decline in cognitive function in those with severe asthma compared to the other three groups. So just to recap here, we learned that acute airway inflammation is associated with microstructural brain changes that are indicative of neuroinflammation. Compared to age-matched healthy non-asthmatics, those with asthma show evidence of widespread neuroinflammation and neurodegeneration. Plasma biomarkers of neuroinflammation and neurodegeneration are associated with asthma severity and brain microstructural changes. And that asthma is associated with CSF indicators of synaptic degeneration and may amplify the, the deleterious effects of these other risk factors. <clears throat> 
So I've covered multiple possible mechanisms uh, up to this point in my talk through which the interactions between the brain and inflammation could give rise to neuroinflammation, neurodegeneration, neuronal dysfunction, um, depression, and cognitive decline. And now I'm going to try to integrate all of that into one cohesive picture for you. So in response to stress, um, there's a shift in myelopoiesis toward the generation of immature pro-inflammatory IL-1B secreting monocytes through sympathetic nervous system activation. These monocytes traffic to the brain and in the lung, the brain and the lung, where they um, participate in this inflammatory cascade further. And in the brain, they contribute to psychological and cognitive dysfunction. In the airway, Allergen triggers both a type 2 and a type 17 inflammatory response with proliferation of these Th17 cells, increasing um, the recruitment of eosinophils and neutrophils to the lung. These Th17 cells traffic to the brain um, where they stimulate NOTCH to increase microglial activation and drive astrocyte differentiation. Now, um, Neuroinflammation or microglia activation is an important indicator of neuroinflammation and reactive astrocytes release VEGFA to increase the permeability of the blood brain barrier, amplifying this whole inflammatory cascade. So there are a number of places in this framework where one could intervene, where one could target with interventions to um, help disrupt this process, beginning with the response to stress. So that brings me to the last um, significant part of my talk today, which is can behavioral interventions be helpful in this relationship? And I would say that perhaps one of the most pressing questions that arises from all this work showing the bi-directionality of the relationship between um, the brain, brain activity and inflammation is, do interventions that target the mind and its response to the environment impact inflammation in the body? And so, and so um, to address this question, I use mindfulness-based stress reduction um, or MBSR as an intervention. And this was um, developed by John Kabat-Zinn at the University of Massachusetts Medical Center. And it teaches the very simple practice of paying attention to what's happening in the moment without judging it, without trying to change it or wanting it to be any different. And this practice takes place in the context of sitting meditation, walking meditation, yoga, and guided body scans. Now in this study, we recruited healthy volunteers as opposed to those with asthma, and they were randomized to either eight weeks of training in MBSR or to an active comparison intervention called the Health Enhancement Program. The health enhancement program consisted of aerobic exercise, balance and agility training, nutritional education, and music therapy. Just as in our prior studies, we provoked a stress response using the TSST, and um, we actually generated an inflammatory response in the skin of these participants using capsaicin cream. So capsaicin is the active ingredient in chili peppers. For those of you who cook, you'll have some experience with this. Um, it causes um, uh, neuropeptides to be released from sensory nerve endings in the skin, evoking a neurogenic inflammatory response or a flare that looks like this. It really is not as bad as it sounds. Um, the, what you see in red is the flare response. The outline is how we quantified the flare response and um, by measuring its area. And we measured the um, response to stress using cortisol in saliva. And here you can see that the cortisol response to the TSST declined to a similar extent in both groups, suggesting either that both of our interventions were equally effective at reducing the stress response or simply that participants habituated to our stressor. On the other hand, we did see a significant group difference in the flare response such that those in the MBSR group showed a much smaller flare response compared to those in the HEP group suggesting that MBSR may be a better buffer for the effects of stress on inflammation. We repeated this very same paradigm, only this time comparing a group of long-term meditators to a group of non-meditating uh, or meditation-naive participants who were matched in age and other important demographics. 
And here we found that the long-term meditators had both a smaller cortisol response to the TSST, as well as a smaller flare response to the capsaicin cream, corroborating our evidence that meditation can indeed um, help to reduce the descending um, stress-related stimulation of inflammation in the body. So the next logical question in this line of reasoning is, can MBSR be helpful in reducing the effects of stress on inflammation in a clinical population, um, especially a population with chronic inflammatory disease? And this is data that was analyzed by Estelle Higgins, who is an extremely talented research intern in my lab. And in this study, we recruited asthmatics who had um, pretty significant elevations in airway inflammation at baseline, making them at risk for ex exacerbation. And they were randomized to either eight weeks of MBSR training or to a waitlist control. And we measured um, in these participants changes in psychological symptoms and asthma control at baseline and then at various points during and after the intervention. And first, we examined whether we saw the expected psychological effects in this sample. This is the first sample that we um, used MBSR in a clinical um, group before. And indeed, um, MBSR relative to the waitlist group reported significant increases in mindfulness and significant decreases in psychological distress. And in terms of the asthma outcomes, we found a significant improvement in asthma control, which is a measure that's used clinically both in asthma diagnosis, um, as well as in determining treatment efficacy and risk for future exacerbation. So from baseline to the end of the study, to put this in context, 32% of our MBSR group showed what's considered clinically to be a minimally important difference in asthma control, whereas those in the waitlist only 12% of those in the waitlist group showed this um, minimally important difference in change in asthma control. Though the MBSR group did not show changes in depressive symptoms in this study, those who had the highest level of depression symptoms at baseline were those who benefited the most in terms of improvements in asthma control. And finally, MBSR changed the relationship between psychological distress and asthma control, such that at baseline, they were highly correlated in both groups. But at the end of the study, they were no longer predictive in the MBSR group. Psychological distress was no longer predictive of asthma control, whereas it still was in the waitlist group. And importantly, it was those who had the biggest declines in psychological distress who showed the biggest improvements in asthma control. So um, in, in terms of our intervention studies in healthy participants, we showed that mindfulness training buffered the effects of stress on neurogenic inflammation in novice meditators. Long-term meditators showed reduced stress responsiveness in neurogenic inflammation compared to our non-meditating controls. In our asthma patients, mindfulness training was successful in reducing psychological distress and improving disease control in asthma patients. Um, the improvement in asthma control was strongest for those with the highest symptoms of depression at baseline. And MBSR training altered the relationship between psychological distress and asthma control. So I want to take just one minute. I know that this is going long and you all are tired, um, but I promise it'll be just one minute to talk about the future therapeutic implications of this work. And so I've just shown you that intervening at the level of the mind and stress perception can influence asthma outcomes, really clinically meaningful asthma outcomes. But there are many other opportunities um, to, of places to target with interventions in this theoretical framework that I have um, built out and should be tested in future research, including um, activation of the sympathetic nervous system and targeting of the IL-17 and IL-1B immune pathways. And so with that, um, I will thank the funding agencies who supported this work and um, the not so small village of people who all helped make this possible. Thank you for your time. <laughs>
That was the real hard part. I said, now is the real hard part. So I'm Will, um, I, you know me. <laughs> um, so um, I didn't really touch on uh, this particular part in this talk, but I know in other research um, that you highlighted um, a specific neurophenotype that you used to help identify um, or that you were able to use to identify the different subtypes of, um, of asthmatics, like long-term responders or, or early phase or versus late phase responders. Um, and it seems like this kind of stuff could have a really good useful clinical utility. Um, I'm wondering if you've considered trying to adapt this or try to find a way to implement that clinically. And if so, what steps would uh, you wanna take to make sure that it's more um, implementable and more readily accessible? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, thank you for that. Um, as we all know, we it, it is not a clinically feasible um, scenario to think that asthma patients are gonna be brought into the laboratory and scanned with a with fMRI in order to identify neurophenotypes for these patients. But really the idea behind this was to, um, as a proof of concept, to show that um, there may be a, a subpopulation of people who have asthma who, whose emotional responsivity or stress responsivity significantly contributes to their asthma symptoms. And we could do that by showing changes in their neural response, right, of salience network nodes. And so that was in the, the study that you're talking about, that really was um, the idea behind that. However, that can be taken after we, we demonstrate that there are people, particularly people who have this inflammatory phase of their asthma response, um, that can be used and actually is being used clinically in the sense that um, I participate in a group called the Asthma and Toxic Stress Network. And it's mostly a collection of, this was organized from um, providers at UCSF, and um, it's mostly um, asthma physicians and also some psychiatrists who have recognized that um, psychological triggers are really important in some of their patients. And it needs to be an assessment of the context that these symptoms are occurring within needs to be done acutely in asthma clinics so that providers um, can take that into consideration in the approach that they're using to manage um, their symptoms in their patients and particularly in relationship to the efficacy of glucocorticoids. Um, if they know that they have a sample that, or patients that are coming into their clinic that are under lots of stress, they know that those medications are going to be less effective. And so they need to have other tools. And those tools can be intervening at the level of the mind. And that is actually happening, at least in California. Um, ACEs are being assessed now in, um, in patients with asthma in the clinic, as well as other um, forms of chronic stress and being incorporated into treatment plans. Uh, this might be relevant to um, what you just mentioned. Um, um, so my question is that Black, Native American, and Latinx populations have the highest asthma rates, deaths, and hospitalizations. And I'm wondering how, how might your work help in addressing this um, health disparity? Really good question. You're right. Um, rates of asthma and, um, more importantly, severe asthma are more common in um, Black Americans and in Puerto Rican Americans, actually, and um, in those in low socioeconomic um, situations. And um, I think that how this work can in reduce health disparities in, is in recognizing that what's happening in the airway, first of all, did not only start in the airway, and it doesn't stay in the airway. And so in recognizing the importance of the world that we live in, the environment that we're swimming in, in managing those, at those asthma specific symptoms can help to shape policy in terms of driving systemic changes in access to healthcare, in the endemic stressors that they're disproportionately experienced, 
by the communities that you're referring to. Um, but there are other sort of non-obvious ways, I think, that um, that this can be addressed in terms of even um, gestation, in terms of mothers who are pregnant, which we know that the development of asthma begins in utero mm -hmm. and um, making sure that prenatal care is equitably distributed, that those mothers um, stress in utero that has a significant contributing factor to the development of asthma. So first of all, you have the underlying genetic predisposition for asthma, but not everybody who has the genetic predisposition manifests asthma. And so figuring out what are the factors that um, contribute to the difference between those with an under, underlying genetic vulnerability and those who actually develop the disease I think can go a long way to addressing those disparities, including um, the psychological factors that we've talked about in addition to access to healthcare and the disproportional rate of C-sections in people who have not had good prenatal care um, because of exposure to the microbiome upon method of birth. Mm. Thank you. Sure. Um, Sure, I'll, I'll ask my other question. Um, your work primarily focuses on acute causes of inflammation uh, rather than health issues that may develop over time. Um, so I'm wondering how, um, how might insidious issues that have been linked with inflammation, such as unhealthy microbiome composition, um, play a role in asthma severity and treatment? So how things like my, the disruptions in the microbiome might lead to asthma severity? Sure, yes, and, um, and or any other um, more uh, health issue that might develop more over time as opposed to an acute stressor that leads to airway inflammation. Sure, um, well, the microbiome definitely contributes to the development of asthma, first of all, those pathways have been really beautifully mapped in terms of exposure to environmental microbes in terms of training of the immune system early in life. And having been exposed to pathogens in our environment in um, creating a resilient immune system that isn't um, hyper responsive. So that's, that's sort of the first um, line, I would say, where the microbiome, which is not just outside of us, but it's also inside of us, um, contributes to asthma severity in the, in the development of asthma. Um, when we think about the microbiome, most of us think about the gut, which is the largest part of the microbiome, but we have microbiome in our mouth, in our nose, in our airways, on our skin, and all of those um, components of the microbiome impact the expression of asthma. I have a little bit of data on this. I haven't talked about it in this talk, but um, it's really difficult in, to measure the microbiome in the, in the lung because it's contaminated by the microbiome from the mouth. And so the only way to do it is through bronchoscopy. Mm -hmm. We tried to do it um, in measuring the composition of the microbiome in sputum samples that were probably contaminated with the mouth. But we did find um, relationships between the dominant populations in the microbiome from the lung and the amygdala response to the TSST, um, which we saw can, through the, all these pathways contributes to um, the propensity and perpetuation of airway inflammation and asthma. Mm -hmm. um, but separate really from asthma altogether, you have the, um, the importance of the development of the microbiome for brain function, both in, in development as well as throughout life. And so really independent of any other chronic inflammation that's happening, if you have dysbiosis in the gut, um, we know that it impacts brain health and um, brain function in important ways that predispose us um, to psychopathology, but also to um, uh, deterioration in brain health in the forms of um, dementia. Those studies are really just ramping up now. I'm aware of that. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, so I know that um, you did a good deep dive into MBSR and other mindfulness interventions as one particular um, 
way to target some of these mechanisms. Mm -hmm. um, I'm wondering what other therapeutic interventions you would consider looking at or examining if something like relaxation therapy or something else might be a good way to target specifically some of these mechanisms that are a bit more behavioral. Behavioral interventions, you mean? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, two other interventions that I have given some thought to, um, particularly because of their relationship to asthma as opposed to other types of chronic inflammatory diseases, there's actually a little bit of data on this, is um, breathing, um, particularly breathing that can shift the balance from sympathetic to parasympathetic activation, sort of um, you know, rapid inhale and long, slow exhale. That's hard to maintain for um, a, a period of time, but it can be done with pace breathing. So I think that that's one potential for targeting of the down regulation of the sympathetic nervous system, which was one of the proposed critical pathways in linking the neural response to stress with changes in airway biology. Um, and and um, biofeedback or even neurofeedback, I think are other are two other strategies that can, and there's a little bit of data that have been used successfully in asthma. Not neurofeedback, but biofeedback. Yeah. Thanks. Hi, uh, I'm Mike. I'm a postdoc at McLean Hospital, Harvard Medical School. And uh, first of all, I just wanted to express gratitude as a person with asthma for the, the work that you're doing and others are doing, just really fascinating, inspiring stuff. Um, especially the concept of being able to alter the acute inflammatory response to, to asthma. Um, I, I found the data on neurodegeneration to be quite striking um, for severe asthmatics. And, you know, of course, many, well, this is out of my wheelhouse, but as far as I know, neurodegenerative disorders tend to not be currently treatable. I was just wondering if there's hope for people who have already gotten to that point to be able to, to maybe repair some of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, I think that this is an area of my work that I um, care very much about right now, particularly because of its public health implications. In the beginning of my talk, I indicated that 10% of the population has asthma. And when we think about the burden on the healthcare system that Alzheimer's disease has. And then we add to that, you know, potentially 10% of preventable, um, you know, 10% of that is potentially preventable, um, especially because this is a disease that starts in the first decade of life. So if we, if we acknowledge and recognize these relationships and took them into consideration in the management of asthma, at an early age, what kind of difference might that make? Um, in terms of once you have those processes set in, um, yes, I do believe that there is um, something to be done, done about it. And I think um, a ray of hope comes from rheumatoid arthritis. And so rheumatoid arthritis is the chronic inflammatory disease that has, um, has been an early adopter of uh, biologics um, in terms of pharma pharmacotherapy. And they, um, use biologics ret almost universally in the treatment of rheumatoid arthritis. So naive question, but what are biologics? Monoclonal antibodies. Um, so they block specific signaling pathways in the immune system. And um, rheumatoid arthritis is also associated with an increased prevalence of, de of um, dementia. And um, there is a growing data suggesting that specific um, monoclonal antibodies not only bring the risk of developing Alzheimer's in patients with rheumatoid arthritis um, back to that of those without a chronic inflammatory disease, but actually lower it. Wow. Um, because we know that inflammation happens in people who don't have chronic inflammatory diseases. TNF alpha blocker actually is, has been the one that's most associated with being neuroprotective. Um, and one thing that I think is important to recognize is that we have a lot of good medications in managing asthma, and there is some evidence that those medications are neuroprotective to some extent. Um, the degree to which asthma is optimally managed in those who have it, there's a huge range of variability, and um, in, a, in a large number of people, it is not well managed. Um, and it is itself a public health burden or a public health crisis 
So I think there are two ways to think about this. One is optimal management using the tools that we have already and using them well um, to, so I think it's important to note that symptoms, so the feeling of chest tightness is not always um, indicative of a lack of airway inflammation. You cannot have symptoms and still have significant airway inflammation. And so using measures that are non-invasive to assess airway inflammation routinely in the clinic, I think is important in making sure that that airway inflammation is well managed. And then thinking about the fact that the drugs that are optimally manage asthma symptoms may not be the same signaling pathways yes. through which the, the signaling pathways that give rise to these changes in the brain operate through. And so recognizing that asthma is not just a disease that's confined to the lung, but has systemic effects that need to be on our radar in order to prevent this accumulation of um, neural injury across a lifetime is really important. Thanks so much. Hi, Melissa. Um, really interesting line of work uh, that you presented today. Thank you for sharing. Um, I really appreciated especially this theoretical framework that you put together about how the mind and the body and inflammation are interacting, especially within this disease of asthma. Um, and I was curious about how you might um, think about taking this framework outside of asthma and thinking more generally about the relationship between mind and body and inflammation and neuropsychiatric disorders in general, and how we can start tapping into and exploring some of those questions. Yeah, that's a big question. Um, I think, you know, it's, it's no secret that um, inflammatory processes in non-clinical populations contribute to, at, contribute to psychopathology. Um, this is a growing field of work that um, many of my colleagues do looking at the contributions of inflammation to psychiatric disorders in, in medically healthy patients. Um, and that has met with mixed success. Um, and I think it's because as we know, depression is not a homogenous disorder and not everybody who has depression or anxiety or schizophrenia um, that's attributed to an immune dysfunction. And so I think what the work really needs to happen is to identify um, those groups of people for whom these psychiatric problems does have an immune dysregulatory contribution and then identifying the signaling pathways that we can target um, as opposed to thinking only about how do we manage this with um, therapeutics that target the brain. So yeah, I, I guess that's how I would respond to that. Thank you, it's really mm -hmm. interesting, thank you. Hi, um, thanks for your talk. I, you, you touched on a lot of kind of physiological and neurological outcomes um, from this training and talking about uh, the interaction between the brain and body uh, with asthma. And I wanted to ask about um, kind of people's psychological experiences tied to these, especially um, have some family and close friends who have auto-inflammatory diseases and experience brain fog and um, tend to say that this is pretty common in people with auto-inflammatory diseases and uh, asked me what that might be. And I always um, kind of thought it was something like this. So I wondered if you could speak on that. Yeah, I mean, I think that what, what you're talking about is, a, um, is one of the functional outcomes, right? That we associate with these increases in inflammation. It's, it's, you know, really similar, I think, to what patients with some forms of depression report in terms of um, the cognitive end of that sort of, you know, not being able to think clearly. And I, are you wondering about the mechanisms that underlie that, whether these same mechanisms are at play? Yeah, I, I'm wondering if this, this um, kind of like inflammation in the lungs signaling to the brain and then neuroinflammation. Yeah, that's what uh, I would speculate. And yeah. we do have a little bit of data on that in this um, this sample that I showed where we compared asthma and non-asthma in terms of brain microstructure. 
Um, we didn't have many measures of cognition in all of those participants. The only measure that we had in all of them was reaction time. And we did see a relationship between the change in white matter microstructure and um, a slower reaction time globally, and which we interpreted as sort of like um, cognitive processing speed. Um, but that is an area that I want to um, collect more granular level data on, and I plan have plans to actually in the future. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. I'm Natalie Pilgrim. Again, I'm coming from Emory University. I'm a grad student there working at Yerkes. And I, I, I'm sure this is a question you're tired of getting, but since brain fog was mentioned, I'll, I'll ask about implications for long COVID and whether there's studies being started on implications of having like an acute infection that has lasting effects. Um, well, I think that, you know, I don't know a lot about um, long COVID and what has been learned about what gives rise to the symptoms of long COVID, but what I have of what I have heard is a neuroinflammatory hypotheses about, I mean, we do know that COVID does provoke neuroinflammation and um, that is probably a contributing factor at least to the experience of long COVID. Um, and I, I think that that would be likely true of any um, chronic immune system, uh, a situation where there's there's chronic immune activation, whether that is in um, a chronic infection, um, that would probably be worse actually um, than the levels of inflammation that we're seeing here because those in, during infection, inflammation is generally higher. Um, so I would I would predict that it would be a strong uh, neural um, inflammatory component to those symptoms of long COVID. Yeah, thank you. Hi there, my name is Josh Cruz. I'm a PhD student in neuroscience and public policy program here at UW-Madison. Um, I had a question about whether or not you've examined hypoxia in relation to asthma and how that kind of relates to both brain development as well as um, neurodegeneration neuro with your samples and whether or not chronic versus inter um, intermittent hypoxia that inter uh, interacts with um, asthma has any effects. Yeah, good question. Maybe you were a reviewer on my last screen. <laughs> <laughs> Hypoxia is a really important um, consideration here. Um, I, I can tell you what I know about it um, based on the literature in my own work. Um, in the samples that I have measured these neurodegenerative changes in, um, the only subjects who that is really a relevant question are those with severe asthma, probably have had intermittent hypoxia as part of the expression of their asthma. Um, the more mild participants generally don't, and we are still seeing these changes in people with more mild asthma, suggesting that it's hypoxia may have a contributing factor, but it isn't entirely hypoxia. Um, hypoxia also causes neuroinflammation. And so um, it's sort of, you, you know, we could, um, we could quibble about whether it's airway inflammation or whether it's hypoxia. Um, but I think that the end of the story is that many of the aspects of the pathophysiology of asthma do give rise to neuroinflammation, whether it's through their effects on the cardiovascular system, whether it's through direct effects of these signaling molecules on the brain, whether it's through hypoxia. Um, I think they're probably all contributing factors. I haven't talked much about cardiovascular, the effects on the cardiovasculature, but in asthma, even in children, we're talking about children as young as 10, you do see um, the beginnings of cardiovascular disease um, associated with the increases in systemic inflammation. And so I, am, I would be shocked if there were not a component of what we're seeing in terms of neurodegeneration and asthma being an effect of like small vessel disease and effects of asthma on the cardiovascular system. Thank you. Mm -hmm. When a patient presents with a psychiatric disorder, what labs should a provider order? Would it be CRP? <laughs> oh boy. Um, 
I think that really depends on the context of the participant, which is why I'm not a physician, right? Like I don't, I'm, I'm uh, not good at making those, um, those, you know, immediate decisions about what to do when there's a patient in front of me. Um, I think if it's somebody who, who doesn't have a chronic inflammatory disease and you suspect underlying inflammation, yes, getting, um, you know, a CBC and, you know, sort of the, the basic um, pro-inflammatory signaling molecules that tend to be elevated in people who, who, who are medically healthy, like CRP, IL-6, TNF-alpha, those would probably give you an idea of if um, there was either an underlying infection that was unknown that could be contributing to symptoms. That's very well known in some psychiatric populations um, or whether it might be a contributing cause to, for example, depressive symptoms. Um, but in a, in a population with a chronic inflammatory disease, those, those might be different. Yeah. And maybe I can make a comment too, just to, from a clinician, clinical standpoint. You know, typically uh, we do not get inflammatory markers in depressed patients. Um, um, they really have not been shown to be of any real value therapeutically, but in patients that, you know, where you're unsure of what's going on, or if the, if the depression or anxiety is refractory, or if there's a clear inflammatory illness, um, certainly then, you know, looking at some of these inflammatory markers like SED rate and, um, uh, CRP, you know, are, can be of value, but I would generally say that we don't measure those and they're not particularly helpful clinically at this point. Hi, Melissa, Lana, great talk. Um, I wanted to ask if you had any alternative hypotheses regarding the peripheral inflammation affecting brain inflammation. So you talked about the migration hypothesis, but I wonder if you had any thoughts on vagal nerve signaling um, and contributing to parenchyma and meningeal microglia signaling in the brain, especially given your interest in the mindfulness-based and breathing-based interventions that might play a role in that system. Are you talking about ascending or descending? Ascending. Okay. Um, so I think that, you know, that I, I really didn't talk about how those immune cells, I did talk about cells migrating to the brain. And I do think that that is um, a part of the picture, but you also have, um, you know, afferent nerve fibers that innervate the long vagal nerves being one of them that um, can signal the brain directly and cause release of um, a pro-inflammatory cytokines de novo in the brain. You also have, um, you know, circulating inflammatory cytokines in blood that can signal through the blood-brain barrier, causing cha neuroinflammatory changes in um, the brain that way. And then, you know, we also have the glymphatic system where cells are circulating through the glymphatic system and interacting with microglia that way. So I think that there are, um, I don't think it's one pathway. I think that um, probably all of these pathways are involved when you think about the purposes of the body being able to inform the brain about what's happening and the, the brain needing to be involved in that regulation. It wouldn't really make sense to have to be reliant on one single pathway. Thank you. Okay. Thanks so much, Melissa. Um, wonderful, so much exciting data. Um, I'm wondering if you could spend just a minute touching on, um, you know, there's a lot of evidence showing changes in brain function um, as a result of MBSR and changes in inflammation as a result of MBSR. Um, and we're kind of looking at how brain changes may mediate those changes in inflammation. Um, and I'm wondering if you could just sort of touch on that briefly. Um, like ongoing analyses and candidate mechanisms. And stuff. Well, maybe I should have you actually be the one to answer that question since you're the one that's doing those analyses. Um, most of these um, analyses really unsurprisingly are focused on the salience network as this, you know, as this network in the brain where the function of the body is informing, you know, the response of the brain in terms of its um, its relationship to emotion. And I would say that 
these behavioral interventions are likely acting through um, a change in one's distress about those signaling pathways coming up from the body. And so um, in, the, in the fMRI task that I used, it was, uh, I didn't describe it as such, but it's an asthma variant of the Stroop task. And really it was meant as a probe for how, um, what sort of the baseline vigilance of the system is uh, to information that is directly relevant to what's happening in the body. And, um, you know, we've seen in, in the analyses that you're doing, we've seen a reduction in some of these nodes of the salience network in the response to um, these asthma specific words or a change in regulation, I should say, a change in the regulatory ability of these brain regions um, being related to the change in asthma control. Um, and so I would uh, describe it um, as a, a, a change in the ability um, of, the, of the salience network to regulate the response to the information that's coming up from the body and then having this descending effect of um, not only reducing distress about the symptoms, but in, in the long run, reducing the symptoms themselves. Thanks. Did you say, Ned, that there's a, a yeah, virtual there's, question? There's, I'll put the mic on. One last question here. Um, this uh, uh, asks if you would please, um, whoops, I just lost the question. Hang on one sec. I can find it. Would you please speak to the relationship of ACEs, adverse uh, childhood experiences, and increased at, between that and increased inflammation? Do you think clinical screening for ACEs could be useful for differential treatments for inflammation, mediated medical illnesses, and or psychiatric disorders, such as mindfulness-based interventions, DBT with training and pace breathing? Well, I... I think we have to be really careful in using um, blanket interventions like MBSR in um, in people who have ACEs, especially ACEs that are trauma related. Um, and that's another conversation that I'm, I'm happy to have later. Um, I do, as I mentioned earlier, in terms of my participation in this asthma toxic stress network, um, they are actually part of what they're doing in incorporating this information clinically is screening for ACEs and using the presence of ACEs in the lives of their patients um, to, to, to differentially decide on treatment pathways. And those treatment pathways are not just pharmacological. So it's not as if they're just going to a leukotriene inhibitor instead of an inhaled steroid for somebody with ACEs, but thinking about it more holistically and trying to figure out how to address um, the fact that they had ACEs in the, the sequelae that it may have had in their life. So incorporating um, therapy in the, the, in the treatment plan when somebody goes to see an asthma physician, um, as opposed to you know, having to go to many separate doctors and not really having um, the a specialist be informed about the context that these symptoms are happening within. And so I, I do think it's essential to um, screen for ACEs in terms of um, the treatment of medical illnesses. And, you know, I think that that's also a, a critical important critically important part in treating mental um, health as well, knowing about the presence of early life adversity, especially trauma. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you, Melissa, for that wonderful talk, and Sydney as well for the talk preceding that. Um, so we're going to wrap things up. Uh, just want to thank everybody for coming. Uh, it's another great meeting. 
each year we say this is the best meeting, but this is actually is the best meeting. <laughs> they keep getting better even after 27 years, believe it or not. So, so uh, I want to really thank the presenters. Did a great job, and it was nice to have the time to get to know you and for the students to, to be able to interact. And also want to congratulate our travel awardees that uh, received the award and hope that hopefully that you really benefited a lot from this and stay in contact with us. I know Richie and I would be happy, I'll speak for him a little bit anyways, <laughs> maybe he would be happy to provide uh, other mentorship as we did a little bit today to you if that can be helpful. And thanks to the audience for, for joining us and the virtual audience as well. And particularly Amber, we're gonna give you a round of applause again. Thank you. Uh, for everything uh, that, you, that you've done. Uh, we're looking forward to seeing all of you next year, um, hopefully, um, and uh, we we'll, don't have an exact date yet, but, but it'll be around this time next spring. Richie, can you say a few words? Yes, thank you. It's, uh, I wanna also just acknowledge how wonderful it is to do this with you, Ned, every year. Uh, it's really uh, a sweet partnership that um, continues and is really special and makes being at Wisconsin special. Uh, and um, uh, if any of you have any suggestions for future speakers, uh, please send them our way. And uh, I just wanna thank everyone. This was really one of the liveliest uh, symposia we've had. And the uh, I, part of it may just be the pent up uh, juiciness of being back together in person. Um, but it was just great. And I want to thank all the speakers for their um, absolutely stellar presentations. Every one of you was just fantastic. So thank you so much. Okay. And that's all. Folks. <laughs>